Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Thank you, worship team, Minister Toby. New international version. No notes for you. And I'm going to use mine as a guideline. Second Chronicles chapter 5. This is when the ark is brought into the temple. They, they, um, Solomon's temple has been built, paid for by David. Verse 2, Solomon summoned, summoned to Jerusalem elders and leaders. So they come in and it's this whole incredible moment of bringing the ark. Verse 7, and the priest brought the ark of the Lord's covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place. And put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place where the ark covered the ark and its carrying poles. Go to verse 11. And the priest withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves. Everybody say consecrated themselves. Regardless of their divisions, all the Levites who were musicians, Asaph, Heman, Jeduthun, and the sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar dressed in fine linen and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. How many? 120. The trumpeters singing joined in unison were as one voice and gave praise and thanks to the Lord accompanied by trumpets, cymbals and other instruments they raised their voices and praised the Lord and sang he is good his love endures forever then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud and the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. This is a manifestation of God's power and glory in the Old Testament at the dedication of the temple. Clearly from scripture we have a, a new and better covenant than the old covenant. Amen. And I don't know if you've been in meetings where God's power has been manifested to such a degree that Really, he's the one ministering, and it's not somebody up front with a microphone ministering. It's like a cloud at times. So I've never been in the service like that. We'll stick around. Amen. What's fascinating to me is this 120. Does that sound familiar? It ought to go to Acts chapter 2. Acts in the second chapter. If you've come in this place in need of healing and a breakthrough, you've come to the right place. If you came to this place for hope and encouragement, it's also the right place for you. I don't know what you have need of, but I know the one who sits on the throne who lo got so loved the world that he sowed the seed of his son as evangelist John just said, God sowed his son so he could have many sons and daughters, of course. And I don't know what you're going through tonight, but I do know that God is able to help you, able to heal you, able to set you free, able to release provision and breakthrough. Can you say amen? It's not, it's not dead pharisaical religion. We really long for God to come. I pray, God, come in your power tonight. I pray, Lord, you'd come like a cloud. You'd come like fire. You'd come like wind. I pray you just come and set this place ablaze. Lord, what the, what the Father has promised, release, Lord, your power like never before. That people would be firmly convinced, touched, transformed by your word, by your presence. Acts 2. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one, in one place. Suddenly, the sound of a blowing, a violent wind came from heaven, 
and filled the whole house where they were setting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors of Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Peter addresses the crowd. He stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is that was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my men servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and the signs in the earth below, blood and fire, billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The reason Pentecostal churches were called Pentecostal churches because they were always preaching and teaching about Pentecost. This is the story of Pentecost. We read 2 Chronicles 5, which is a type and shadow of Acts 2 at the dedication of the temple when the ark comes in. It's a type and a shadow. It's a foreshadowing of Jesus coming inside the temple, no, not, not made by human hands, but made by his own hand, knit together in your mother's womb. It's a picture of the ark the presence of God, the power of God, the holy of holies, no longer behind a curtain that was torn from the top to the bottom on, the, on that Friday that Jesus was crucified, but to come in and live inside your heart. He doesn't live inside a temple made by hand. He doesn't live inside this building unless we're here. He's here. If we're here, we're the church. We're the, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and 1 Corinthians talks about it in verse chapter 3, that we're the nios, or the dwelling place of God. So oftentimes people dumb down what church really is. God's power is here. And so many people come, not necessarily here, but I mean like across America. I don't really have a good lecture for you tonight. I have something that God's put on my heart. I want to go to the next level in God. I've seen incredible things and they've transformed me. Amen. And yet there's so much more. Lift your hands to heaven and ask for more. There's more. He will touch you in direct proportion to the hunger that you have. And if you're not hungry and you've been seduced by the world, you've not consecrated yourself like they did. These priests, they consecrated themselves. And I promise you, the 120 in the upper room consecrated themselves too. They were so desperate, so hungry, they didn't know what they were going to do. Their Savior had been crucified and he gave them instructions in Luke 24. Go ahead, go there. He gave them instructions to wait. To wait, don't go anywhere. Stay in Jerusalem. Until you're endued with power from on high. What kind of power? Power from on high. 
Power from heaven. What the Father has promised. Luke 24, 35. Here's what Jesus said while they're still speaking about this. Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. Does anybody, anybody grow up in Catholic church besides my brother and I? I, I always liked that part of the service where you, you would turn around and shake hands and say, peace be with you. And then we were taught, you know, you, you go and shake their hand, peace be with you. All depends on guess who says it first, peace be with you, and then also with you. Does anybody remember that? Let's try it. It's quite fun. Go ahead, turn to your neighbor and say, peace be with you. And then the other person says, and also with you. And also with you. Amen. Amen. There you go. Somebody said, pastor, I'm a recovering Catholic. Well, I'm so glad. Be healed. Verse 37, they were startled and frightened. I mean, could you imagine and you're in your home and you're, you're, you know, you're talking and bam, there's the Messiah. Startled and frightened, they thought they were seeing a ghost and he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do your doubt, doubts rise in your mind? Look at my hands and feet as I myself touch me and see I'm not a, a ghost does not have flesh and bones like you see I have. Wait for it, here it comes. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it. And he ate it in their presence. Verse 44, he said to them, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, prophets, and the Psalms. Verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. I'm going to stop. During that offering teaching, I felt people getting quickened. Something shifted for some people. There, there's something that shifts. It can sense it in the spirit. There is a shift that took place in your mind like, dude, God could do that for me. Absolutely. Yes, that's right. God is not a respecter of persons. So they didn't understand things, but when the Holy Spirit touched them, all of a sudden they have understanding. God's going to touch you and give you understanding. Come on, ask God for that. Lord, unlock my, my, my understanding. Speak to me. Open my mind to the scriptures. Understand the scriptures. And he told them, verse 30, 46, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Verse 49. Everybody say verse 49. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. I want to remind you all here tonight, maybe some for the first time, those online, those listening in the future, God has a promise for you, and the promise is a promise of power. It's a promise of power. You don't have to wring your hands in worry. You don't have to shrink back under destruction. You can be filled with power from on high to change your life forever. You say, well... How? I'm going to teach you about that. Somebody said, why is King so different? There's a lot of other churches like ours, for sure, all around the world. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've not experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, but it takes power to live for God. It takes power to resist the devil. God doesn't want you to just try to make it, try to, you know, fake it till you make it. What a bunch of malarkey. I'm not sure what malarkey is. Don't fake it, fake it till you make it. No. Get some power. There must be in your life. There will come in your life as you serve God and as you allow him, as you hunger for him, as he fills you. There comes in your life a sense of the unexplainable. The unexplainable. What do you mean? There are certain things in my life you cannot explain it. You're like, how did that happen? And I go, I have no idea. Being in the right place at the right time, supernaturally ending up bumping into this person, bumping into that person, and then all of a sudden the answer to your prayer comes to pass. There is, there is a sense of the, of the uh, supernatural and the unexplainable. If you don't have that in your life, God, God longs to bring to you supernatural power to, to fulfill the assignment. 
Every person here has a divine assignment from God, and your divine assignment can only be fulfilled with God. It takes God to fulfill the assignment from God. Say that. It takes God to fulfill the assignment from God. You cannot do it in the arm of the flesh. You are not smart enough. You're not handsome enough, pretty enough. You don't have the resources. No. When God speaks to you, he, he'll literally put together a team, he'll release vision, and vision releases faith, and he moves you forward, but without the power of God, you'll never see it happen. I love what somebody said about our building. There's no way to explain this. How did you guys do this? Bankers said no, but God said yes. The devil said no, but God said yes. I, come on, the devil said no, but God said yes. And God always says yes to his children, yes to the vision. He, he always leads us in triumphal procession. There's no weapon formed against you that shall, but you're going to make it. You're going to more than make it. You're going to overcome. You're going to overcome. I want you to move forward in leadership. So get through leadership class. Stand up on your feet. More is in you than you could possibly know. Come here, sister. Lift your hands to heaven. More is in you than you could possibly know. Everything you've been through is going to be a tremendous, uh, like a, a seed bag of, of power. You're not disqualified. You are qualified by the blood. Move forward in leadership. Move forward in leadership. Take the steps. Move forward. You have a tremendous testimony. My power is not only on you now, but being released to you to set many captives free. Fire. Many. Many. The devil said no, but God said. I think I just heard a message about that just recently. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. Come on, somebody say, I want the promise. Now you might say, then I already have it. That's nice. There's a whole nother levels. That you, you might have whatever you have. There's another level. And you know what I've found? You can't OD in God. You, you, there's no toxic levels in Jesus. You can have as much as you long and desire for. He opened their minds, written. Okay, I'm going to send you what my father's promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power. There is power available for you power available for you. It's this metaphor of clothing. A priest used to wear, well, it all depends on what denomination, but everybody see like those collars, black collar, a little bit of white there, and it's a priest. I had a friend of mine that was an evangelist. He's gone to heaven now, but he used to dress up every time he got on an airplane. He used to dress up. He was raised in our church. It's the, it's the craziest thing. Uh, he, um, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and tell the story. His brother Nathan was his name. He's in heaven. He, uh, he came into the church, and he was, dude, he was unusual. Okay, so he, he had a do-rag. You remember Minister David? Anybody know what a do-rag is? Okay, so he had like a do-rag, and he wore the do-rag all the time. And he would sit about four rows back, five rows back. And, you know, like I'm telling a story right now. It's not, it's not usually, you know, the the time to stand up and go, hallelujah. You know, when I'm just talking about some guy and then you would just stand up and go, amen. You'd be like, amen. You know, it's not like everybody's amening right now. I'm telling a story. Amen. amen. Okay, so it was not like that. Nathan would stand up and he wouldn't even look forward. He wouldn't be like, amen. It wouldn't be like that. He'd stand up, literally he'd do this. He'd stand up. Amen. He'd go sideways. You're like, dude, what are you doing? That was just weird. It was a little unusual. Security was very concerned about him, and rightfully so. He's one of the biggest drug dealers in Kauai ever. The, the, the history of Kauai, everybody knew about him. Later on, when he came to Kauai and did a revival, people were blown away. Like, could this actually be? I mean, it's like, he was just a very violent man. He got gloriously saved, but he, he was, uh, his elevator didn't go all the way to the top at first. All of his puppies weren't barking. He was a few sandwiches short of a picnic. But over time, 
he began to change. And before you know it, he was still saying amen in the wrong time, but he was facing forward. I remember when, I remember, do you remember that? I remember like, dude, he's facing forward now though. Come on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then before you know it, like, uh, he just started changing. And I, I started having conversations with him. He was best friends with um, uh, Prophet John Harkey. Some of you know John Harkey. They were besties. And they worked on a roof. They're roofers. They would do tear-offs. How many of you know what a tear-off is? And they literally challenged themselves to pray in the Holy Ghost, to pray in their heavenly language as much as they could. And they would literally have no words of English to each other unless it was absolutely, you know, mandatory. Like, you need the tool and the guy's got to, dude, can you pass me that? Okay, then then they go right back into tongues. And literally, they'd pray in tongues seven, eight hours a day, a 10-hour job, two hours of regular talking, communication. They would sing occasionally. And they'd pray in the Holy Ghost for seven and eight hours. Month after month. After month, after month, they were, doing, they were doing an experiment. And what ended up happening, I think it was on the same day, God spoke to this guy, Nathan, and said, go get a loan and go with Dr. Morocco to India. He got a $5,000 loan. This is what it required. And he went to go to Dr. Morocco with India, to, to India. And I was supposed to go on that trip too, but I had some other things hold me up, and so he went, I can just tell you, I was so jealous, I was like, whatever, dude, you and your bandana, hallelujah, <laughs> I'm just being real, I got healed, like 30 seconds later, but those thoughts did cross my mind, I'm thinking, taking a loan, shouldn't take a loan, that's not God to take a loan, you should believe God, come on, some of you said some things, yeah, I have too, the same time, John Harkey hears from the Lord and says, you're not going to go in to become a general contractor. You're going into ministry. He was going to take his test to become a, a general contractor in the state of Hawaii. And the Lord said, you're not doing that. You're doing full-time ministry. So what ends up happening is Nathan goes to India. I mean, this is a short version. I should probably tell you the front part. I'll tell you the front part. God speaks to this Nathan guy and says, go to the airport. He literally, they quit their job with the roofer. Nathan goes to the airport and he stands there praying in tongues at the airport. I know the story. I was there when it all happened. So it's not like something I read on some faraway land. So he just stood there praying in tongues. And some young kid comes up to him and says, dude, I know this is crazy, but I think you're supposed to come with me to the big island of Hawaii. And he's, he just felt like, that's God. Okay, I'll go. He had a bag. He had a, he, the guy gave him a, what was it, a partner pass or, you know, one of those things, and he jumped on the plane, and he went to the Big Island. He got off at the airport, and it just so happened to be with a bunch of students from YWAM. There's YWAMers all over the plane. They get off, and he just gets off, and he's like, Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? And this kid says, dude, I think you're supposed to go to our school. So they tell the bus driver, hey, this guy, I think he's supposed to go to our school. And the bus driver's like, Amen. So they bring him in, they bring him to the, they, they bring him to, I, to the uh, um, YWAM base in Kona, and he meets upper level people and they give him a full ride. That day, that day, give him a full ride and he goes to Bible college. This is not some faraway thing. I'm telling you, God's given you power. He can speak to you. It, he's just a guy with a bandana, and, and so am I, basically. If you'll just get some faith in your heart and realize that the Father wants to send you power from on high to bring you into the unexplainable fulfillment of your assignment. It's unexplainable. But if you're not willing to lay it down, I mean, you got to be willing to look like a fool in the face of your peers. It's like that sometimes. The things of the Lord are foolishness to those who are perishing. And many times God wants to release power. Don't go stand at the airport praying in tongues unless the Holy Spirit sends you there. He was there for a year. And now this is the Indian story. He comes back. He's like full of the word, shining. I'm like, well, I want to go to Bible college. I was just... I'm a late bloomer. Is anybody else a late bloomer? Amen. <laughs> he, back to the India story. He goes with Dr. Morocco. I couldn't go. 
they send off, they go to India. He's in India. And somebody comes up to him and hands him a, a gold watch, a gold watch, and gives him $5,000 cash. Now, that might not be a big deal if you were in the U.S., but let me just tell you, if you go to India, ain't no one handing you any money ever back then. It was total poverty. It was a total mission trip. And someone handed him a big, fat envelope with five grand. And he went on that trip, came back with a gold watch and a new anointing and handed the five grand back to the people he borrowed, the, the bank that he borrowed it from. I'm telling you, God wants to release his power in your life. Amen. It's this metaphor of clothing. Yeah, I started telling you, see, he was a priest. He would wear these priestly clothes. And I asked him, why are you dressed like a Catholic priest, dude? He's like, oh, bro, that's easy. He's just full Hawaiian pigeon was his first language. Oh, easy, bro. I'm like, okay. He says, because all the Catholics talk to me, and then I get them saved. <laughs> no, literally, he would wear a priest outfit. He'd go on airplanes, and they'd be like, um, Father, he'd be like, yes. <laughs> Father, I, I need help. He says, yes, you do. You, you do. Have I told you about my son, Jesus? Oh, no, Father, let me tell you. And he would lead people to Jesus. He'd lead them over and over and over. He, he had this mission of leading Catholics to Christ on airplanes because he constantly, I almost thought about doing that. That's, that's, that's pretty awesome. But how do you know a priest is a priest with well, the clothes they're wearing? How do you know a doctor is a doctor is a clothes they're wearing? Do you have any nurses here? Is anybody wearing scrubs and you're a nurse? You came from work. All right, so you, I, all the way in the back, She's on her chair and she's wearing scrubs. By that, we can understand that you are a nurse. Yeah, a, a what? All right. Radiology. Thank you. So she's wearing her radiology clothing. Priests have their clothing. God has clothing. God has power for you. Power for you, for your families and all your little babies. God has clothing. He's got power from on high. He wants to put on you. What does it look like? It looks like signs, wonders, miracles, healing, deliverance, provision. It looks like the kingdom of God. Come on, somebody say, I got some clothing from God. Do you though? Do you? You know, if you're not anointed and you don't see signs and wonders, it sure ain't God's fault. What do you want him to do? Get crucified again? Let's all have a praise break. Lift your hands to heaven. Say, oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's look at this text here. Jesus appears to him. Apparently he's on carnivore because he just has a piece of broiled fish. It's an inside joke. Opens their minds, which is amazing. Second Corinthians 3, but their minds were dull, verse 14. Your mind can be dull. Many people have an offended mind. They can't receive things because they're just offended. And I was offended at Mr. Bandana Head. Wrong timing, amen, facing, sideways guy. I was. It was interesting. The Lord dealt with me. And, I, and I've, I personally have been through some delay because I was offended. I needed healing. I, I, I just I just offended. Some of you were offended right now. Some of you are still offended from the offering team. Some of you left. Their minds were dull. To this day, the same veil remains over the old cover when it is read. It's not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. I say only in Jesus is it taken away. So literally, 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 their minds are dull. They can't, they, can't, they can't understand because they're blind. The God of this age has blinded unbelievers. And, but here's what I've found, that many believers are also blind. That they're like, oh, well, I, I just, I like the John 3, 16. I, I want the sin's forgiven, but, you know, the, I'm not into all that. Tongues. I'm not into tongues. I'm not into the 
clothe power thing. We just want to behave ourselves and have a, a, a nice, relaxed service. I'm finding all across America as I've traveled just to Pittsburgh and different places I've been around, people are so fed up with just an in-order thing. They want the power. Uh, they, want the, they want the clothes. Give me my... You know what my daughter taught me? And my, my son-in-law... They do this thing. We do FaceTime. Everybody do FaceTime? Okay, we do this FaceTime thing, and then she would go, fit check. I'm like, what? She's like, fit check, Dad. I'm like, okay. I remember when I was first heard it. And she goes, fit check. What are you wearing? I'm like, I'm wearing a shirt, some pants, and some shoes. She's no, Dad, what kind of shoes? I'd be like, oh, these are... These are Nordstrom sneakers that somebody just gave me. What kind of pants? I don't know. Banana Republic, I think. What kind of shirt? It's also Banana Republic. So, Dad, when you do a fit check, fit check, you got a Banana Republic shirt, Nordstrom shoes, and uh, Banana Republic uh, pants, and that's as far as we go. Hey, buddy. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Fit check. Anybody ever heard that? It's a, it's, a, it's a Gen Z thing. It's a, come on, come on, somebody say fit check. Fit check, okay. So in the spirit, how's your fit check? Are you clothed with power or not? Don't make a theological framework and understanding to excuse away your lack of power and impotency. Let's move on. 1 Corinthians 2, look at this. 12, what we've received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This we speak not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. There's a necessity to... Allow for the Holy Spirit to help you to understand concepts, spiritual understanding in Scripture. God just doesn't release. There's wisdom from above and wisdom that is earthly and devilish. James talks about that. God has a wisdom for you. But if you're, if you're offended in your mind and you just don't, I don't know, I haven't experienced that yet. Well, there's a lot of stuff you haven't experienced that you could experience in God if you'll open up your heart and you'll ask him to show you, bring you a spirit of wisdom and revelation and your life will change. It takes revelation to fulfill the divine assignment. It takes power to see it come to pass. You say, I don't understand what you're saying. We'll stick around. Some of the words you will understand. Others are understanding. These are spiritual words I'm sharing with you right now. And if they're not discernible to you, they will be one day. Go back and listen to it. Ask God to open up your mind. Open up your heart. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is yet to come. It's this role of the Holy Spirit guiding, empowering, cloak. Come on, fit check. Bump your neighbor and say fit check. Do you have power? When's the last time you had something happen that was supernatural? You said this morning. Good, that's the way it should be. And it's not just so that we can have goosebumps. Oh, I've got goosebumps. Good. I, I, I mean, praise the Lord. That, that, that I suppose is a discerning factor of maybe the Holy Spirit is upon you. But why does it come? To lead you into all truth, but to, to, to heal the sick, set the captives free, to save the lost, and cause you to be a witness. It's not just so you can be like, I feel goosebumps. And then you stay in church with goosebumps? Like, who, is that going to turn a nation around? What is a goosebump? Ask Pastor Gill after service. He'll be at the next steps to ask defining chicken skin or goosebumps. All right, verse 47, he gives them vision and repentance, remission of sins. He's telling them, he's giving them a vision for what they're going to do. Forgiveness of sins should be preached. Look at verse 47 of the main text, Luke, Luke 24, 47. Repentance, remission, of, remission or forgiveness of sin should be preached, preached, preached in his name to all nations. 
No one's going to be able to know unless someone preaches, unless someone teaches. So when's the preacher coming to town? It's you. It's you. You're the one. I'm the one. We're all supposed to share our faith. Can you say yes? And you are my witnesses of these things. Matthew 24 and 14, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. Then the end will come. God has given us a, God has given us a vision to reach the lost. I was so encouraged this morning when I heard some of the new numbers of, of the size of our church. What was that again, Dr. David? Number four is people that come at least once a month. What was that number you gave me? About 1,700 people. So we're about 1,700 here at the church. That's encouraging. I, I got some new stats today. I'm encouraged by that. That's on the way to 10,000. That's what we're believing for. I don't know, 100,000 people in the community in the whole valley from Talkeetna to Chugak, 100,000 plus. I'm just contending for, for 10% of the population. Can you say amen? We're working out details for Anchorage. We're going to hit that thing like a, like a fireball from heaven. I can't hardly wait. And uh, there's some challenges with the dates, but it seems like it's going to be August 24th. We'll, we'll hone in on that. And uh, going to be at the Captain Cook, and we're going to get a big enough place to have 1,000 people. I'd like to have 800 to 1,000 people. That's where my faith's at. Why not? And have a great, great power pack service. And just say that, you know, the king's coming to town. I certainly don't mean the church, but I also mean the church. Jesus is coming back. The key to this passage that we read, the main one. Luke 24 is verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. John 14 talks about the Holy Spirit. Here Luke is quoting Jesus about the promise of the Father. Stay in the city. Stay in the city. They used to have these tarrying services. Raise your hand. You would be older, no doubt. Tarrying services in Pentecostal churches. And what they were was, if you wanted the power of the Holy Spirit, you would come to the front. And believe me, they weren't looking for somebody to preach a 30-minute message. There's so, much, there's so many 30-minute messages and sermonettes that are causing people to become Christianettes that have no power, no authority, no power. I mean, nothing. And they would invite people up at a tarrying service and they would lay hands on them and you get some of these mothers in the church around you and they'd just be like, turn loose, turn loose, hold on, hold on. They'd be shouting all kinds of stuff. How many know what I'm talking about? But what was amazing is that you would come under what they were under. They were baptized, they were clothed. Come on, Minister Ava, give me an amen. They were clothed with power. You didn't mess with these ladies. The mothers in the church. And, and you could come and just come under the, just come under the, come on, honey, come under the burden. Has anybody ever been in a service like that? And you literally come up and people lay hands on you. Now, there was some abuses with that. But the, it also should not be thrown out with the, with the bath water. The baby should not be thrown out with the bath water. There are times where you're going to receive power if you'll respond. If you'll respond and you'll put yourself under the spout where the glory comes out, you put yourself under the burden and stay there in your home, in your car, in the church. You stay until you're clothed with power, until fire comes on you. You say, I already got my prayer language. This is much more than a prayer language. The old time revivalists would say this. They say, go get your own baptism. And they weren't talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I am talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus is saying. The promise of the Father is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wait in Jerusalem. They had no idea what he was talking about. Acts chapter 1 and verse 4. Maria Woodsworth Edder. That's not Acts 1. That's me going back to a story. Maria Woodsworth Edder, anybody know who that is? She is a, um, I, I don't remember the time frame of when she lived, but um, 1800s, I think, 19, 1900s, early 1900s, I'm going to say 1930, 1930, something like that. You can go look. Um, she was a wild 
woman. And she said, you have to get your own baptism. And she was not, she had already preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's about receiving a fresh touch of the fire of the Holy Ghost that's more than just the fulfillment of theological truth and doctrine of the baptism of the Spirit. There's something else. Talk to Rodney Howard Brown, my friend, and we hope to have him up here. We're putting that together by the grace of God. He says the same thing. He just got sick and tired of the same old deal. Began to cry out and cry out and cry out. Lost his voice. And then, fire. Talk to anybody that's, done, that's been used by God to turn cities upside down, to release, I mean, every revivalist across our nation's history and other parts of the world, they all say the same thing. But you know what I've found? Most people will not put the position themselves to wait in Jerusalem, their personal Jerusalem, until fire comes. Because, you know, we just got things to do. It's the same reason there's 120 in the upper room and, and, and there's 500 that saw him ascend. I'm, I'm not very good at math, but there's, there's quite a few that didn't go. They went back. Where the 500 saw him ascend, why is there only 120? The tragedy of the upper room is there are only 120 people there. Where are the rest? Acts 1 and 4, and being assembled together with him, he commanded them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he had said, you have heard from me. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Acts 1 and 8, going to look at a bunch of scripture, and then we're going to pray. But you'll receive power. You'll receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Acts 2 and verse 1 and 4, the day of Pentecost, we read it. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. There's five instances in the book of Acts where the fire of heaven and the baptism of the Holy Ghost took place. Acts 8, turn there on the screen now if you can. Acts 8 and 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive, prayed for them that they might receive, prayed for them that they... So they've received the word of God, so there's something else. They're not getting born again. Philip, the evangelist, preached. They've received the word. They're born again. They've repented of their sin. That's what that means. They received the word of God. Everybody say they received the word of God. When they came down, verse 15, they prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet it had not fallen upon any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts 9, go there, keys, please. And Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying his hands on his head, brother Saul... The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. I mean, you got to work really hard to, to discuss and argue this thing away. The apostle Paul got born again when Jesus appeared to him. He said, Lord, Lord, who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Guarantees like, oh, I believe you're the Messiah. I mean, that's it. He's born again. So now he's born again and blind. There's a lot of people born again and blind. Born again and blind. It's people that are blind have not understood the power of the Holy Ghost. I've had people try to explain to me, say to me, yeah, no, that, that's not how that, that's not how that, I said, dude, too late, it's just too late. I've had, I've liked too many miracles, too many, I, too, I know too much scripture, I, you just, you're too late. Well, that, that left with the apostles, show me one scripture that said, if, the, don't you think if that's the case, if it's the case that we didn't have the, the, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, if that really did happen, don't you think that there would be some line in scripture that says, and no longer seek for the baptism of the spirit because that's over when the apostles died. They have cessationist conference. How'd you like to go to that? 
It's crazy. Here, come and get a baptism of depression. You have no power. Just wave a white flag till Jesus comes and sets you free sometime, at some point. The devil will come. Just try to grin and bear it. What, what do they say, actually? A cessationist conference. How dumb can you be and breathe? Pretty dumb, apparently. Well, what happens is it didn't happen to them. Pastor Vince, they don't have that experience. I'm going to pick on you because you're awesome and I love you. So you didn't have, the, this man is leading a life group years ago. Everybody in his life group is getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. But the leader. Now in our, in, our, in our work here, you can't be a leader if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit. But he went to another church back then. <laughs> and uh, they didn't have that that philosophy of ministry, which is a biblical one. They, so they made him a leader, and he was a great leader, but he wasn't filled with the Spirit. And all these people are getting filled with the Spirit, getting their prayer language, his power of God is falling, people getting healed, and he just got irritated. He's like, what the heck? Like, Lord, how is that? He, he worked up on uh, cocaine, on the uh, military installment, of the... the uh, missile guidance system and the, uh, he's, he's really smart. Electronics and all that and telescopes and whatever. So he went up there and I think it's on a lunch break. Did I got that right? On a lunch break, he starts walking around. What the heck, God? How come, Lord? I want that. Come on, God. He had just gotten so hungry. And I, he just, all of a sudden, power, power, power came on him. And your prayer language is the most unusual I've ever heard in my life. Now, it expanded, but back then, that's it. Let's get it from the, from the one who actually did it. Let's, what was your first words of your prayer language? Let me hear it. Can you turn this up a little bit? This is his first words in his prayer language. It's like Holy Ghost Morse code or something. What is that? That's awesome. Began to weep and cry. Became this great leader. He didn't make an excuse and join the cessationist conference. And, I, you know, for me it was hard because I, it, it hit a place of rejection. I, had, I, I struggled with rejection and it's just like, Uh, yeah, I guess the Lord, you know, doesn't want to give me that gift. I was rejected. So it's just hitting this place of rejection in me. And, and finally, it was like I heard it so much. I heard it preached so clearly and accurately, which I'm attempting to do right now. I thought, no. No, this is for me. Get hungry. Get hungry. And I remember when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost, I walked from Kihei to Hana praying in tongues except I didn't make it to Hana that was my goal my mother was living in Hana and I walked just I just kept walking fire all over me people would stop you okay I'm like they'd be like okay come on everybody say Shandai one two three I have prayed in tongues. There you go. That's, that's a joke. I got picked up in haiku by some anti, some Christian anti picked me up in haiku and drove me to my mother's house. And I think that was a result of me praying in tongues. It's a long walk. Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, scales fell from his eyes, something like scales. He received his sight. Go to Acts 10. Take your time. I have it on good report that the children's ministry doesn't mind staying till 10 tonight. <laughs> Uh, that wasn't very nice. Lord, forgive me for that. <laughs> Acts 10. 
while Peter was still speaking these words, verse 44, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. Everybody say the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. Verse 45, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Verse 46, y'all there? Verse 46, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. They heard them what? Speaking in tongues and praising God. Go to Acts 11. As he began to speak, do I have that right? As he began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. As in the beginning, verse 16, that I remember the word of the Lord. He said, John, indeed, baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Go to Acts 19. If you've not been baptized in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, push aside everything that would try to argue against it. Position yourself to say, I want that gift. Lord is going to give it to me. Oh God. Hey, the, the, people are blocked because of theological blockages. People are blocked because of sin blockages. People are offended and that blocks people. People are blocked because their grandfather told them tongues are from the devil. Their grandmother or some well-meaning person. I'm not knocking them, but not everybody's theology is sound. There's tongues, a prayer language, and there's tongues with interpretation, which is prophecy. Many people, and I've taught it before, if you haven't heard it, then, then go, uh, why, why do I pray in tongues? I think is a, a message is on you. Go listen to that. It's on YouTube. Go listen to it. So when we pray in the Spirit all together, everybody can pray in the Spirit all at one time. When there's tongues with, with, that's a message from God specifically, there'll be an interpretation. And there's a, I don't know how to describe it, there's a clear discerning of which is which. So if I say pray in your, in your heavenly language, pray in your spirit, that's where everybody can pray in their prayer language. And I would challenge you, do it as much as you can. Pray in the, in the spirit on all occasions. Build up your most holy faith. Jude talks about that. All right, Acts 19, and it happened in Paulus and Corinth, and verse 1, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he thinks he's coming upon some people from some church. He thinks he's coming upon believers. He does not know that he's not. Can you imagine if you bumped into, I don't know, should probably leave names of churches out, but I mean, can you imagine you meet somebody? Oh, I go to uh, uh, the First Baptist of Zion Church, and you say, "Oh, awesome! Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed?" How offensive would that be? You're like, "What do you mean?" Oh, and then you begin to tell. That's what Paul does. It was so important to Paul that the first thing he's asking some new believers he meets, you know, he later finds out they're not even born again. They've only believed in John's baptism. They get born again and then they get filled and they're Gentiles and there's 12 in all. It's a beautiful picture of a, like a new Israel, if you will, it's this, this governmental number. It's, it's beautiful. If you've not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is for you. How do you get, how do you, come on, fit check. Bump your neighbor and say, fit check. Are you clothed? Yeah, yeah, see, I wear clothes. Fit check. Banana Republic, Banana Republic, Nordstrom. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about power. Power. It is a night and day Christian experience to have been born again and then born again and receive the baptism of the Spirit. Night and day. It is to... It's, I, I, I don't know, you, 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 you need it. You need. Need 
the Holy Ghost. And you'll notice that over and over and over, they get refilled. They don't just get filled once. They don't just get filled once, they get filled over and over. Why? Because they leak and you need more and more infilling. One of the first prophetic words I ever got in this church, it's in my late 20s, is Jim Critcher. Maybe I was 30. He says, well, you get filled with the fire of the Holy Ghost. I'm like, yes, yes, that's me. He said, man, there's fire that comes on you. I'm like, yes, that's me. He says, but you drain out by the time you get to the parking lot. <laughs> I thought, yes, that's also me, yes. <laughs> right, how to become filled with the Holy Ghost. How to, get, how to get your new threads. Obey. Everybody say obey. Number two, have an expectancy. Have an expectancy. One of those meetings that I've been in, where you, you just, it happens here a little bit. I think we can level up, but... And coming into church, be like, ooh, Mr. Toby, gonna bring it. Ooh, he's gonna lead in worship. Oh, I can't wait. Who's preaching? Because it doesn't matter. I'm hungry. Oh, God, come on. There's an expectancy. Not dead, dull religion. Expect to have an expectancy that God's gonna fill you. Thirdly, praise God. Come on, stand up on your feet unless you're taking notes. Praise God. Four, have hands laid on you. Five, let the Holy Spirit speak through you in tongues. Let the Holy Spirit speak through you in tongues. Well, what do you mean by that? That means don't use English words. Allow for the Holy... You ever made up a song? It's like that. You just allow Him to speak through you sounds and syllables. It's, it's not here. It's out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. Out of your innermost being, out of your koileia will flow rivers of living water. But so many people have a dam here. They're dammed up because in their mind, oh, that's not, 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 I can't do that. I don't want to be embarrassed. You've got to shut this up. You renew this with the word and you understand it's for you. Then you shift and you learn to come from your heart and receive the baptism of fire, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So, first things first. If you're not right with God, give your life to Jesus. You say, that's me, pastor. It's wonderful. If that's you, raise your hand to heaven. You want to get born again. You want to give your life to Christ for the first time. Lift your hand now. Wonderful. Number two, if you want to recommit, lift your hand. You're like, I'm not as on fire as I used to be. You want to come back to your first love. All right. If you raise your hand and you're serious, come out from where you are. If you didn't raise your hand and you know you need to be included, come on up. Meet, meet me right here. There's others coming with you. Church, why don't you put your hands together for these guys? Come on. There's no shame. It's awesome. Come, come, come. Whoa, come on. Come, come, come. Oh, going to have your sins forgiven. Recommit your life to the Lord right now. I want you to pray with me online right here. Pray right out loud. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to die in my place. I believe he rose again from the grave. And I ask you tonight to forgive me of all of my sin. Wash me and cleanse me. Come on, right out loud. Wash me and cleanse me. Make me new. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for hearing my prayer. Amen. Now, I'm going to pray that you get filled with the Holy Ghost. And if there's anyone else that's here, and you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, step out from where you are and just come all across the front. Come. You say, well, I have that already. Good. But you might need to be refilled. Would you begin to lead us? Holy and we're going to pray for these. You want the baptism of the Spirit? Come to the front. All we need is more. You want the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Baptism of fire? Come. Chancy, I want you to help us. Holy Spirit. We're going to come and pray. Come one line all the way across the front. Don't stand behind anybody, please. All we need is more of you. Come on, come, come, come. We want more of you. Sing Holy Spirit. Okay. I like telling this story. It's, uh, well, let me, let me, let me say this. 
if in your heart you're convicted because you know you have sin, then you'll just be shut down and you won't receive anything. But, but we took care of that, did we not? Did we not? If any man can, uh, um, is in Christ, he's a new creation, but that's not the scripture I wanted. I wanted, uh, uh, <laughs> it's in the Bible. <laughs> if we confess our sins to him, I got it. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you just ask for forgiveness, then what has happened to you? You've been cleansed from all unrighteousness. Which is why Paul says you're the righteousness of God. So you're washed. Come on, somebody say, I'm washed. Come on, say, I'm forgiven. I know your mind's trying to say, yeah, but, but tell your mind to shut up. The truth is, it's, you've been paid for. You deserve death, absolutely, so did I. And death was served in Jesus for you and me. And you receive that. That's how you can be forgiven. You don't have to feel like it. Feelings will follow truth. Align your mind up with what the truth is. You're forgiven. So there's no more sin. Come on, somebody say amen. All right. So that's out of the way. Theologically, I tried to help you so that you have an understanding that that's for you. Does that make sense? All right. Got any questions? All right. So theologically it's for you. All that's left for you to do is obey, which if you're standing up here, you're doing that. Now you need expectancy. Come on, lift your hands and say, God, I'm, I, I, want, I want the baptism. Come on, say, I want it. I, I want it. I want it. I want it. Open your mouth. If you don't open your mouth, you're not going to have uh, sounds and syllables come forth. It's hard to speak in tongues if you don't open your mouth. All right. And then you're going to worship. You know, I didn't hit the, the, the last point. You know what? After it is, go into all the world. That's, that's the last point of my sermon. But come lift your hands right now. And we're going to come and pray, pastors. And I want to share this one story. I love Pastor Vince's, the tick, the holy, the holy tick. And then I love the story of Bishop Joseph Garlington, great man of God from Philadelphia. His wife, when she got filled, hers, her first word was oop, oop, oop. Don't try to, don't, if anybody tries to say no, say it like this. That's, don't do that. We don't do that here. That's weird. She tied my bow tie. He tied my bow tie. I went to Hana in a Honda. 